Hi guys, it's your girl Kaylin, and welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be doing the single most request for video I've had, and that is to do a revision of the Warrior Shaman versus Rogue Mage guide. We're going to take everything I've learned since playing Shaman and add onto it all of the new things that we've discovered and learned playing in the last month or so on ladder here in life. So before we get onto it, I just want to say this is the most common comprehensive guide I've ever done and as such is taken the most amount of time so therefore if you do enjoy what I do if you learn something today give us a subscription we are so close to getting to that 1000 mark with the shilling out of the way let's just absolutely crack on timestamps are obviously down below in the description if there's a particular area you want to see discussed or covered and if you have any questions feel free to ask down in the comments or just join the discord as always let's get into this and we're going to start by looking at the spec. So this is the spec that I would probably say is the best two spec for playing against Rogue Mage. The caveat I will give straight away is by saying this is for Rogue Mage. You know, having Mana Tide in other matchups is very good. However, Mana Tide versus Rogue Mage is pretty much completely useless because, you know, you just never get to the point where you need it. Um, so... We go into the pros of this spec, it is highly defensive. The idea of this spec is basically to try and keep yourself alive as long as possible while your warrior is running around hopefully murdering the enemy rogue. Along with this we have some very good mobility. Again the idea is to try and keep ourselves very much alive. The downside is, as I said, that we don't have mana tide and we do lack some of the mana efficiency talents that are available against mage rogue that's just not an issue if you were playing this spec on ladder there will be times when you will think oh bloody hell i wish i had you know mana tide right now and i would have won however given the fact that about 30% of the matches I've played in twos recently have been against Mage Rogue. Um, I think sort of specking defensively in order to try and win at least some of those games is probably a good idea. So to break the spec down a little bit, we will first look at the enhancement aspects of it. So it is a 02041 spec. That means that we do have uh, 20 points in enhancements, which again gives us that increased survivability and mobility. Just quickly looking at some of the actual talents themselves, I do get asked, why do I have shield specialization as opposed to ancestral knowledge? The reason for this is that because of the way the game works, with it being a single raw system, if you block an attack, that can't be a crit, which means that effectively shield specialization very loosely does give you minus 5% chance to be crit. On top of that, we have the fantastic mobility talent that is improved Ghost Wolf, and also Guardian Totems, which we have for A, buffing our Stone Skin Totem, which helps us, you know, live through that rogue damage, and then obviously reduces the cooldown on our grounding. And then finally, we have the god tier talent that is toughness which reduces the duration of movement slowing effects by 50 percent so this is going to be our frost bolts our kernel of cold our crippling poisons the toughness i think is a uh, paramount for 2v2 you know in general and then also specifically in this matchup so jumping over to our 41 points in Resto, we have some great talents here that are going to empower our healing, they're going to make our totems range increased, and also they're going to help with some of the interrupts, also the pushback. I will note now, before we go into it, these first two talents we're going to look at, that being Focus Mind and Healing Focus, they are discussing two separate things. So Focus Mind reduces the duration of silence and interrupt effect. What this means is that if you get school locked, so uh, if you get hit by a pummel when you're casting a nature spell, you are not able to cast nature spells for four seconds. It school locks you out of that magic school. Focus Mind reduces the duration of that school lock by 30%, or if you are blanket silenced by the Shadow Priest spell Silence, the duration of that silence effect is reduced by 30%. On the opposite side of that, we have Healing Focus, which gives us a 70% chance to avoid interruption caused 
by taking damage. So this is worded poorly because you're not really being interrupted. What you're getting is what we call pushback, which is when you're casting a spell and you take some damage, and then you might have been a second into the cast and it jumps all the way back to zero and then you start casting again. This gives us 70% chance to avoid that pushback effect. And then coupled with the additional 30% we get from Earth Shield, which we can see also discussed here, that gives us 100% chance to avoid any pushback on our casts, which is very important when you're trying to cast with a rogue hitting you. Unfortunately, unless we do have the Earth Shield on us, we only have 70% and we still can get knocked back. So in order to try and keep that Earth Shield on us, we then take three points into Healing Grace, which gives us a 30% chance to resist Dispels, or in this case, Spell Steal. Suffice to say, if we have a mage that has stolen our Earth Shield and also our Bloodlust, then that mage becomes a lot more deadly. So in order to protect this from happening, as well as keepers having that Earth Shield and that 100% chance to avoid pushback, we take the three points in Healing Grace. Then we have just one point in Nature's Guidance. I only have one point because I'm a Junai. If you were a different race, maybe a Orc or Tauren, you might have to put additional points into Nature's Guidance. The aim here is just to get three points into hit for your spells across the board, whether you do that with gear, whether you do that with racials or with this talent, it is entirely up to you. You just need to get three points. And then finally, we have one of the greatest talents added in TBC for us. We have Nature's Guardian. This thing is absolutely brilliant. Suffice to say, we've got five points in it. This thing 100% saves your life and will win you games hands down. Jumping on to our totems. So totems are obviously absolutely fundamental to uh, the shaman class, but also they're quite janky and we have to uh, learn how to use them. So in this particular matchup, when we're discussing what totems we're going to be using, the first totem you want to be placing down, um, surprisingly for some, will be frost resistance totem. One of the easiest ways of winning this matchup is by getting lucky. You want to sort of stack things in your favour and the best way of doing that is by giving your warrior and yourself 70 frost resistance. This will help with getting those clutch resists on Novas, allowing your warrior to still keep smacking and that is the reason that it is the first totem you want to be placing. You want to get it down instantaneously because if you can just resist even one of them it will completely change the dynamic of the match very much in your favor secondly we have our water totems these will be the second totems that we'll be placing down if you are against a fire mage you want to be putting down a fire resistance totem. Obviously, they're going to be pompyroing you. These pompyros can, you know, I've been crit, I think, 4.4k at the highest. And the only time I have ever lived and won against a double pompyro mage was when I resisted something like 6,000 damage from their collective pompyro, the resist I got off of this one totem down. However, if you're not fighting a fire mage, and generally you won't be, the water totem you want to be placing down instantaneously after your fire will be poison cleansing. It goes without saying that cleansing poisons is pretty damn good against rogues, and especially given the fact they're going to be more than likely opening on you, if you can get rid of a couple of their poisons as they're trying to stack them, it just slows down their progression and the pressure they're going to be putting onto you. So at this point I will jump in as well before we discuss our next set of totems and mention that one of the very important things not to happen to you is do not get sapped. If you get sapped, generally speaking, that's going to be the end of the game and that does mean if you get sapped at the start. As a result of this, you want to be careful how many totems you place up first. 
If you sit there in the open spamming down four totems, that gives the rogue ample opportunity to run across quickly, sap you, and then they can jump on your, your warrior and savagely murder him. So you have to decide how many totems do I want to place before I jump into Ghost Wolf. If you think they're going to be hyper aggressive, just place the fire, place the water, and then go Ghost Wolf. Generally speaking, I will probably go for about three totems. If you're feeling anxious, just go into the Ghost Wolf and place the totems later. You've got the fire and you've got the water down. Those are the key ones that you want for the opener, and the others can come with time. Speaking of other totems, we have our earth totem so we have two options here and it does come down to a little bit of personal preference here you can either do stone skin totem giving yourself reduced damage from the rogue or you can put down a strength of earth totem basically buffing your warrior's damage it's going to come down to you personally and you know how you feel where your gear is at and so on so both of them are you know completely viable and uh, yeah i would say go for it and then we finally we have our air totems, the trickiest set of totems to deal with simply because you're going to be cycling through them. And before we go forward, because you're going to be cycling through them, it would be worth noting that I am listing rank 1 of Wind Fury Totem. In PvP, I only ever use rank 1 of Wind Fury just because I will be destroying it so often by placing a grounding totem. Therefore, I don't want to be, you know, placing the max mana max level one and then replacing it you know after it only being up for three or four seconds it does save you mana and the only real downside is that there is slightly less increased attack power on the extra swing the you know they still get the double attack nothing else changes it's just slightly less attack power and then obviously grounding totem you know i'll mention it now one of the important things about grounding totem to remember is that the Mage's pet will absorb grounding totem. So you do want to be specifically timing it as close to the mage finishing a cast as possible, as opposed to just placing it consistently and unfortunately the effect being just soaked up by the water elemental. So now that we've got all of our totems out of the way and discussed and we're going to be talking about the macros I use. So if anyone are not familiar what a macro is, is it is a collection um, of spells or actions together. So it does multiple things at the press of a single button and the first macro we're going to be discussing or the first two macros we're going to be discussing are my rank one earthshock macros um, earthshock is incredibly powerful and important for us because it interrupts casts and then school locks the caster for two seconds so this is what we're going to be using predominantly to stop our mage from polying our warrior so i use two different macros for this i have the first one which is the as you can see here the uh, focus shock macro so this is going to first stop uh, casting if I was casting something it will instantly stop casting it and then it will then shock onto my focus target my focus target as you can see is the target to the right hand side and the focus cast bar is the large bar in the center of my screen so when I see that being polymorph I can hit E in my case it's bound to E and then it will instantaneously shock that polymorph the second one is a rank one but this is doing two things so again it just stops casting instantly and then it will either if I am mousing over a target so if my mouse cursor is physically placed on top of an enemy mob or an enemy player it will cast on them however if I do not have my cursor placed on top of anyone and I'm not mouse overing them then it will just cast on my target so this is just a fantastic shock macro um, I use it uh, at max rank as well it's just brilliant and then the final thing to discuss when it comes to shocks is, as we can see here, we've got our two different sets of gloves. We have got the Honor Grand Marshals or High Warlords if you're Horde, and then we have got the Gladiators healing ones as well. In the case of the Grand Marshal set, the equip bonus is that it increases all of our shocks by five yards. However, for the Gladiators, unfortunately, we don't get that awesome bonus we get this shitty one that just gives us two percent crit on our healing wave 
So as a result, what you will often find is that shaman will either, in my case, I just keep using the Grand Marshal's wing mail and never get gladiator's gloves at all, or if you are desperate, you know, for that extra eight bit of resilience and whatnot, they will use the elemental gloves which obviously have less healing on them and less healing than the gladiators sorry the grand marshal's gloves but they do in fact have this set bonus so again it's down to you but shock range is incredibly important in this matchup and i would highly advise you to get it in some way shape or form so the next macro we're going to be talking about here is our nature swiftness macros. So we've got basically uh, two here and we've also got a little bit of a typo so I do apologize. Um, our first one is our NS heal. Again, it's just going to stop casting because we want to be doing this instantaneously. We're then going to nature swiftness which as we can hear means that our next uh, and next nature spell will be instantaneous and then it will instantly cast the maximum rank of healing wave. If you have the name of a spell but not the rank of a spell within the macro then it will automatically cast it at its highest rank possible. So this is uh, absolutely fantastic. Goes goes without saying this is the thing that saves your life the most often. The thing I will mention about this particular macro and just nature swiftness in general is that if you are moving while hitting the macro you will have to hit the macro twice. So I have this bound Q. If I am moving when I press it I will have to go Q and then Q again. Now this obviously is a a touch slower than you know it being instantaneously and b also it does leave you slightly open for it to be dispelled or spell stolen if somebody's very quick so the way to prevent this from occurring is to actually be stood still if you are not moving at the time that you hit in my case q it will just instantaneously do it and it's completely impossible for them to dispel it or interrupt it or whatever. My understanding is that this occurs just because of some janky mechanics because it still thinks that, you know, the spell has a cast time even though it doesn't have a cast time or, you know, whatever. So the next one obviously is not a rank one shock, but it is a NS chain lightning. Nature Swiftness chain lightning is still incredibly powerful and dangerous even as a resto shaman and you're seeing some of the matches going offensive and finishing off the rogue while your warrior is you know cc'd is one of the ways of you know clutching out a win and getting it done and then similarly to uh, the gloves when just looking quickly here at set bonuses for the honor set unfortunately um we do have a four set which reduces the cooldown on your nature swiftness. This is basically completely useless and as a result this is why you will see, or one of the reasons you'll see a lot of shaman using a two piece, three piece. So they have two pieces of the elemental set and then three pieces of the resto set so that they get two set bonuses of 35 resilience just because the four piece is so terrible however when we go on to the gladiator set we come on to actually having a very tasty reduced cooldown on grounding totem which obviously is absolutely fantastic for this matchup and just in general any matchups so finally we've just got some extra macros that I like to use one the first one just being a stop cast macro this is for cast, uh, fake casting I've got a video about fake casting if you are unfamiliar there will be a little box up popping now which will lead you to that then we just have a double trinket macro this is for snapshotting my earth shield at the start of arena so I will have these two trinkets equipped um, I will then put down a Wrath of Air Totem, giving myself some more bonus plus healing. I will use both trinkets simultaneously, because you can do that, um, which gives us all of this plus healing, and then I will place my Earth Shield. I'll then swap my gear to more defensive gear, but the Earth Shield still is calculated at the time of casting, so it will take all of this plus healing from my trinkets into account and also the gear I was wearing. 
As a result, my first Earth Shield is incredibly powerful. And then finally, we just have a weapon swap macro. It's up to you how you choose to use this if you do use this. Um, having a defensive set, so in this case, I have Wound Dagger of the Solaris and Crest of the Shatar. Um, these are my sort of defensive weapons. If I find myself entering into an arena and I think, oh, I'm about to get focused, as I would in the case against the Rogue Mage, I will swap away from my more healing focused weapons because you can swap, uh, you can swap your weapons in Arena. Um, and I would instantly just hit the button and swap to these more defensive weapons, thus giving me a better chance of living. And speaking of my gear, so the full profile um, is available here. Um, the overall stats from this, this is my sort of best in slot before any gladiators gear um, this is all available from five mans there's nothing from raiding here um, but as i said it's all available um, on that link so you can see and there will also be a gladiators version um, available there as well um, but uh, yep as uh, just a quick one this is the gear so let's go on to a little bit of sort of strategy and just some tips I don't want to go into this too much just because we would be here for hours and hours and hours discussing the infinite possibilities of what's going to happen to you. But essentially, the general plan of the Rogue Mage is going to be that they will crowd control your warrior and then they will kill you. So in order to prevent this from happening, the sort of top priorities would be to keep Earth Shield on yourself at all times. You then want to be shocking and grounding the polymorphs or shocking and grounding, you know, big shatter combos and reducing the damage. As I mentioned before, you do want to avoid being sapped, so keep this in mind. You know, if you do drop combat for a drink or something like that, you are, you know, open to be sapped. And then finally, the aim is going to be to just try and kill the rogue. The mage has a few too many outs with double ice block, um, and you, your warrior being able to actually stick on the mage is going to be quite tricky. Is it impossible to kill mages? Nope. It does happen from time to time, you will see so in the footage, but in general we will aim to kill the rogue. And how do we go about that? Well, a couple of tips we have for you. So the first is to actually stack on your warrior. Obviously your warrior is going to get crowd controlled a lot. Sometimes it might just be a simple Nova. If you have run, you know, around the corner off, you know, trying to line aside the mage, which does seem somewhat logical however if you stack on top of your warrior the rogue is then at least forced to take some return damage if your warrior is just sat in a nova so stacking on top of the warrior is uh, it seems counterintuitive but actually works pretty well the next thing that feels counterintuitive but again works pretty well is trinketing shorter stuns or um, shorter cc's so gouge and cheap shot you know if your warrior is going to get uh, polymorphed, it is sometimes worth trinketing the cheap shots. Yes, you obviously will then have to sit a full kidney shot after the fact, but this has then given your warrior an opportunity to play the game. And if you trinket a cheap shot, the rogue is instantly going to go, he's just trinketed a cheap shot, I'm then going to kidney shot him. However, your warrior can preempt that, he could intervene the rogue and take the kidney shot that's about to come, or he could instantly try and disarm, you know, preventing the damage potential of, you know, during the stun. The next tip, obviously, is to snapshot your first Earth Shield. As I said, Earth Shield is calculated at the time of casting. I have a video explaining this as well. Again, link will be up top. Check it out if you want to, but it is definitely worth doing, and it will save your life. The next one is to remember that totems function through pillars. They do not need line of sight. What this means is that if, for example, you and your warrior are separated with him slowed by, say, a poison, here, you know, a crippling poison or something like that on the opposite side of a nagran pillar, you can't get to him. If you place a poison cleansing down, it will pulse through the pillar and hopefully cleanse him through that. The same is true if he's about to get polymorphed and you can't actually see the mage to shock him. You can, however, place a ground new totem that will then function through the pillar and hopefully protect him. 
Speaking of polymorphs, we then obviously have the legendary skull of impending doom. This uh, cheeky little old world offhand puts a dot on the user when they activate it, which will in fact break polymorphs. What this allows you to do, the first polymorph you'll take, you pop it, you have to activate it before you polymorphed, and then once you're polyed, it will tick, break the polymorph, and then you want to instantly swap to your two-hander. And then the final tip, and probably the biggest advice I can give to anybody that's looking to improve, is to record your matches. You know, it's so easy to record your games these days, it's completely free using OBS, which is the software I use. I'll put a link down in the description to where you can get it, as I said, completely free. Record your matches, watch your losses, watch your wins, see, you know, what's going on in your games and highlights maybe some of the areas of, you know, weakness that you can develop. Finally, before we really finish this off and get into some of the fun, just a real quick FAQ. Just how much resilience do I need? As I said, aim for around about 300. 300 is, you know, pretty arbitrary number to be honest, but it seems to be about enough. Should my warrior charge the mage? So this is a question from uh, someone on Discord. Thank you for submitting it. What they were asking is at the very start of the match, should my warrior be charging the mage or should they wait for the rogue to maybe open on me and then they charge? I would say generally speaking, wait for the rogue to open. Um, this obviously then interrupts the rogue because they then get uh, you know, charge stunned. Um, what you don't want to happen is you don't want to have the mage maneuvering your warrior when he's sort of isolated by himself. If you two are disconnected and he's just stuck in a nova, then he's going to be pretty useless for the, you know, the next eight to ten seconds. Um, and that's just a generally a bad start. But yeah, in a perfect world, you probably, yeah, you want to be charging the rogue and try and avoid the mage. What is the best race for Shaman versus a Rogue Mage? It's probably going to be Orc. Um, I think Torin is pretty pretty much up there as well. I mean, Torin is the best overall. But against Rogue Mage, the Orc Resist is pretty powerful. Can my Warrior use Sword Spec? Well, obviously they can, um, and it's perfectly viable. Maces, however, versus Rogue Mage in particular, is quite a bit better just because of all of the stuns. You know, when you get the mace stun, you can then communicate to your shaman and your shaman can, you know, sneak off of heal or something like that, you know, because they know that they aren't, you know, under so much pressure. Um, should I use spell power off pieces? So, Blizzard in their infinite wisdom decided in season one, why on earth would Shaman want healing off pieces? So, you know, they aren't healing off pieces with resilience on them for Shaman. So we have to make do with either the spell power off pieces or using crafted or using PvE pieces. If you've got about 300 resilience, that's probably enough. So if you want to start, you know, experimenting with a few bits of PvE gear just to give yourself, you know, some extra burst healing or something like that, then I would say go for that. I myself use a couple of PvE pieces rather than the PvP stuff and, you know, my resilience is still up there and survivability, it's about okay. So in conclusion, before we get into the actual footage and the games, the thing I will say is, you know, don't get disheartened when you're laddering and you're losing. Mage Rogue is incredibly hard, you know, it's probably about a 98% imbalance between the comps. It's so, so easy for them to win. One of the ways I found that sort of helps with this is, as I said, you know, recording, you know, your matches, but also recording the match ups. So we literally just have a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, and we just record who we play on the night. One of the reasons to doing this, obviously, is you can just, at curiosity, you get to see, you know, who'd you beat and who'd you lose against. But I also find that it helps. You played a night and you've tanked 50 rating or whatever, but then you look at who you've been playing and you've said half of the games you've been playing against were Rogue Mage, well, you're probably going to be losing quite a bit of rating if that's happening. And that does happen. It allows you to set expectations and not hate yourself too much. So thank you very much for watching this first half of the video. I hope you guys enjoy the footage. If you have any questions, then down in the comments is the place to be, or there is obviously my Discord where there is either myself or a lot of other knowledgeable PvPers who I'm sure can answer any questions, or you can just have some general discussion. So thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to subscribe, and I will catch you guys in the next one.
It's all about humanity.
back Chase the light When the world is getting darker I have a dream Where love's the only side So take my hand Join the army of the shadows